Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a weekly discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week, we speak with playwright and lyricist Chiara Alegria Hudis. Hudis wrote the book for the Tony Award winning Broadway show, In the Heights. It's expected to be a blockbuster movie this summer. Hudis also won a Pulitzer Prize for drama and a list of other awards. She has recently released a memoir, My Broken Language. Hello, Chiara, and welcome to the program. Hi, how are you? Doing great, thank you. Um, as a native New Yorker, very interested in your topic. I didn't grow up or really spend much time in the Heights, but I did grow up and spent a ton of time on the Upper West Side. So um, I'm very interested in what you have to say. Uh, so let's start with, uh, we'll talk about your memoir in a second, but I just want to start with In the Heights because the movie is coming out soon. Please give us a nutshell about what what's in store. It's funny that you mentioned the Upper West Side because, you know, there's a lyric in the opening number about I've never been north of 96th Street. And I think a lot of people think, you know, New York City ends at 96th Street or at Harlem, you know. Um, right. or, at, or at 116th Street, which is where, because of Columbia, which is where it ended for me. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, there's, so it's set in this community up here. Uh, I grew up in a similar community in Philadelphia, which is the Latino community. Um, and up here, um, you know, there's a lot of life, a lot of history. It's uh, historically a, a, a first stopping point for immigration, immigrant generations. Um, you know, it wasn't always Latino, it was Irish, it was Jewish, it was Russian, um, it was Puerto Rican, now it's more Dominican. And so we're telling the story of, you know, these generational shifts, um, how people find home over time, and we're doing it with a lot of joy, a lot of love, and a lot of energy. Okay, and you talk a little bit too before we get to your book about your um, that you work with uh, Manuel um, Miranda. Uh, talk about that experience and about winning a Pulitzer for your work. Um, well. Lynn and I, we are similar age. Um, you know, our parents both came from Puerto Rico. And when they came, it's not like they could just plug right into a community that was already complete. No, they came at a moment when they had to help build the community they wanted to live in. They had to build the businesses. And I don't just mean start businesses. I mean, like, build the buildings, too, you know? Um, so my parents were doing this in Philadelphia. His were doing this in New York. You know, then we went to college in the United States. English was both of our first language, unlike our parents. And we were like, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what it is to have all of your parents' dreams on, on your shoulders, to have that they worked so hard to pass the baton to us and are we going to disappoint them? What if we want to walk our own paths? It's, you know, that's that's the American story that we were um, excited to kind of hold hands and tell. Okay, and that parlays right into your memoir. Um, tell us your, your broken language. Tell us what that is about. Well, this is my book, My Broken Language. Um, and this is my story of how I became an artist. It's not my story of being an artist. It's the story of me being kind of obsessed as a child with everything I saw around me, um, a complicated world with many different influences, Spanish, English, music. I lived in different segregated neighborhoods. Um, and I was obsessed with how to tell my experiences and my story, but I didn't always have the right language to do that. Um, and so it's about me kind of using all of these different languages that are broken for various reasons and making a new language that I could call my own and, and tell my truth as an artist and write stories like In the Heights. Okay, go into that a little deeper, if you will. How is it that you didn't have the language to do that? And yet you grew up to become a Pulitzer winning playwright. You know, it's right. It's the thing that's the biggest problem that got my most attention. And so this language problem, here's um, some examples of it that I go into in the book. Um, English was my first language. 
Spanish was my mother's first language. And the more I fell in love with books, the more I immersed myself in English language literature, the better I got in this language and the more I realized its limitations. English didn't have all of the vocabulary to name my truth. A lot of my truth came uh, has Taino agrarian roots, native farming roots in Puerto Rico. Well, English doesn't even have the words to tell that part of my story, that part of my inheritance. My tell, me what, tell me what words there are in Spanish that don't exist in English. I'm just curious. Well, here's an example that's in the book. Um, it's a bunch of friends in college asking, do you believe in God? Pretty straightforward question, right? But I realize in that moment, actually, English and Spanish have those words, but they imply really different things. So I break it down telling that story of how, how do I answer um, these friends of mine, my classmates who do not speak Spanish, um, who are we're all kind of self-proclaimed atheists about a very rich and complicated spiritual history that my family taught me. Um, for instance, you, the word you in English, do you believe in God? It, there's no um, plural form of you in the English language. So when you ask someone, do you believe in God? You're asking about them very personally, as opposed to, for me, um, I inherit, my mother was a priest of um, Lukumi. She is a natural healer. My mother, my grandmother was uh, read the Bible uh, diligently, even though she only had a second grade education. Um, so you wasn't about believing in God wasn't about just me. It was about my women. It was about my ancestors. So that word felt limited. Believe felt limited because I had Rea, said Rea doesn't translate to believe well it does but here's the thing in in the english this kind of english language god they were asking me about is one that involves belief whereas i had laid eyes on pretty extraordinary things um that my healing that my mom had done um visions she had had before someone passed away she saw it she said this person is about to leave us so it wasn't for me about belief or not i'm like oh that exists that world exists it's just whether that's my path i'm walking you know so these ways that english and spanish actually actually don't translate the things that get lost in translation. How do I tell who I am in a way that um, lets it be as rich and complicated as possible? And even the word God, you know, there's kind of one catch all word for that in English, but there were many um, different gods in my house growing up in many different languages. There was Padre Dios, Father God. There was Atabe, which is a Taino fertility goddess. There was um, Chango, which is the source energy of lightning. This is, we're talking Yoruba, Taino, and Spanish. So even though English was my best language, I needed more. I needed more in order to write and tell that story. I've heard it said that, for example, there are 20 plus ways or 20 plus different kinds of sand described um, in Arabic. But of course, in, in English, sand is sand is sand. Um, Pretty much. Uh, exactly. So yeah, uh, th there. Every culture, I think, has its different, uh, you know, language uh, expressing things that are different depending on the culture. So um, okay, so let's get back to your story. Is that your father was Jewish, your mother was Puerto Rican, they married and divorced. You seem to identify much more with your mother's culture than your father's culture. Tell the story of how that happened. That wasn't always the case. Um, until I was five, I was just me. I didn't know what an identity was. I didn't know what authentic was. I was just me. Um, when my parents separated, they were actually never married, um, but they were together a long time. And when they separated, I all of a sudden became aware of the different identities in my life because they didn't, they didn't share space anymore. My dad moved to a very segregated white residential area suburb. My mom stayed in Philadelphia with her Boricua family. And so I saw a division of my life because it happened. In terms of which, which part of me I identify most with, I will say as, as a writer and an artist, I have chosen um, 
to really tell the stories of my Latino family, my Perez women, um, in part because uh, I, my mom raised me. Like there was just more hours logged there. So along with my Puerto Rican stepfather who also raised me. So that's just, those were the stories I was hearing and being part of every day. That was more a part of my daily life. Then again, when I was assigned all of the literary classics in high school, when I get to a space like Yale and see that these magnificent institutions and literary canon that are historically more leaning towards white, I see they're missing out. They're missing out on the, the lessons I was learning, the incredible epic stories I was living through in Abuela's living room. Um, and so in some ways, it was just by virtue of I was raised in a Puerto Rican house, but in other ways, it was a choice to say, oh no, we are a part of the American narrative too. And it's gotta be told because it's magnificent, it's important, it's, it's our history. Tell me how American culture would change if it appreciated to the extent you would like to see, not just Hispanic or Latinx culture, but, and of course there are many, many, many different kinds of Latin culture, um, just as there are many, many, many Spanish speaking countries in the world. Speaking from personal experience, two examples that come to mind are um, a value, two values that my abuela taught me that I, I talk about in the book uh, one is just the absolute strength and power in listening. That listening is a position of strength and a position of respect and intelligence. And I, I feel like this nation doesn't value listening as much as speaking. Um, and, and so we have a hard time hearing each other sometimes. But, you know, listening was a real muscle we honed at Abuela's house because we're hearing our history. We're hearing people, different sides of the story. And that's how I approach my writing and my professional life. I don't go into a room to say, well, here's what I think and here's what's happening. I go into a room ready to listen to the other people in the room. I think the larger culture would really benefit from more of a practice of listening. And another one goes hand in hand with that. You know, what does power look like? And I think we think of power as something very decisive, something very strong and active and present. But what I saw in a lot of my elders, for instance, my Titi Ginny, um, who was in the book, she started a bunch of community gardens in abandoned lots in North Philly. You know, she turned something that looked like blight and made it a point of pride. And this was very humble work. She didn't get paid to do that. She, you know, she got, she came home dirty every night. She was working another job. She exhausted herself just for the humble love of community. And that humility is something that I saw as holding tremendous power, actually. I don't think this nation thinks of humility as power, but I think of humility as extremely powerful and effective. But how can you ascribe that to a whole culture? For example, look at what's going on in Colombia today. Um, and I have a friend who's Colombian, whose mother is stuck in Colombia. Mm. His mother and his brother uh, moved to Colombia from El Salvador. His brother went back before all the, the police shooting started. But he, his brother told him that the police are just shooting into protesting crowds and killing scores of people. So that's part of Latinx culture, too. I think this is a really important question. And I think the thing is, you can't ascribe blanket statements to a whole culture. I think that the term Latinx is a really interesting term to dig into a little bit more because in my experience, the how that term came to be is that people from very different backgrounds, from different Caribbean islands, from Central America and South America came to this nation and found common points of purpose to gather around oh, we need these resources in our community. We want to advocate for, uh, you know, more humane immigration. And so something like a, a notion like Hispanic or Latino becomes very useful as a connective tool to gather. But you don't want that term to just therefore imply, oh, we're all the same and we all know within that term Latino, there's wild, there's a tremendous diversity of culture, of experience, of values, of terrain, um, you know, and so what, what I'm doing, I, I'm definitely, my book is speaking, not even for all Boricua or Puerto Rican culture. My book is speaking for the lessons I learned in Abuela's house. Is that a particularly or a distinctively 
uh, woman's view uh, of the culture. It's a distinctively woman's view. I got asked in a different interview, you know, how did machismo uh, play into your life? And this is a machismo culture. And unfortunately and tragically, we see that playing out in the island of Puerto Rico right now um, with women being murdered. Um, one woman is murdered, I think the last statistic I saw every seven days um, in gender motivated violence and through this machismo culture. Um, I was so lucky to not really be privy to that because we had a largely matriarchal family. And so we didn't have to protect ourselves from some of the violence that can come out of, of that machismo. There were things like domestic violence, no doubt, but really I was in a woman's world and we were safe to share our wisdom, little healing things like, um, you know, back in the island, there was not baby powder when Abuela was raising her children. So doing the babies. So, you know, you put um, cornstarch on the babies, but you know, these little things about how to heal, how to be resourceful. And I was very lucky that that was my lens on life. I, I carry it with me to this day. Another thing of just that strikes me about Puerto Rican culture is that Puerto Rico, even though it's very much a part of the United States and there's talk about granting its statehood all the time, when I've spent a lot of time there and have relatives there. Um, they, they do see themselves as a separate country almost. They talk about the mainland, not the United States. And uh, so did that figure into your view of Boringue culture? Absolutely. Um, you know, even the use of the word migrant or immigrant is, I think, telling. You know, technically, my mother, when she came to Philly when she was 11, she, technically she was not an immigrant because there was, you know, she had a U.S. passport. Um, but really, culturally speaking, she was. You know, it, it that is a distinct island with a distinct history that does not have all of the political rights of states. Um, you know, and when she comes, for instance, they were farmers. We were people who worked the earth. Then all of a sudden we're in Philadelphia and with the way gentrification worked in the city, when my mom first moved to Philly, there was a huge green space park on the corner. I remember the big old historic trees on those blocks. They got pushed farther and farther out of the city, farther and farther north to where there are no trees on the block. There is no park on the corner. So what does that do um, to people who are earth people, who are farmers, you know, who have built generation after generation around cultivating that wisdom? Um, this is one of the reasons why the, the Ginny, my aunt, why she finds these eyesore abandoned lots and says to the city of Philadelphia, can I buy it for a dollar? Can I get rid of the pile of old tires? And can I have, can I grow some batatas? Can I grow some yuca there? And that, that to me is very um, indicative of the way you were raised. You really were right. You talk about escaping to the trees when you were a young child and you, you know, you had a crisis in your life. Your, your escape was to nature. Talk about that, please. When we, I, I grew up in the city, but for these amazing two years, and I loved being a city kid, but I had this great experience that I got to be both. I was also a country kid because for two years, we moved to a horse farm about an hour outside of the city. I saw something totally blossom in my mom that I had never known. I was only five, so I only knew five years worth of her, but she was a city lady as far as I knew. But when we got out there, she taught me how to pull up the weeds, how to make a circle in the earth, how to plant herbs in that earth, how to water them and tend to them, and then how to use those herbs. I said, mom, mom, how do you know this? You never did this in Philly. And she started, that's when she started telling me of her deep history, of her papi's farm in Arecibo, of um, bringing him a little cup of cafecito every day. He would drink it, she, and, and she would watch him. She, she told me once that she would watch him sweating in the sun. And she thought his sweat in that early morning coffee time was the same as the dew. She didn't understand the difference between her papi sweat and the dew. She literally thought her papi was part of the earth and part of the land. Um, so 
she taught me about that and I took naturally to it. I would go and I would hug the trees. I would tell poems to the trees and the trees were very good friends. They were good listeners. <laughs> what do you think about, uh, before we get too far away from your playwright side, uh, Broadway opening up again? I can't wait. I'm excited for Broadway to reopen, but I'm really excited for also community theater to reopen, local theater, regional theaters. I think having spent all of this time away, I, I miss the craft and I miss the community tremendously. But you know, I, I remember the first time I gave my mom a hug in over this year, you know, it was recently when we were vaccinated and I felt safe to do that. And you feel that hug differently after all that time. Um, I see her face differently after all that time. I don't take it for granted in the same way that I used to. And I hope that we have a return to theater that kind of re-embraces the art form and reinvigorates the, the creativity and innovation around live performance, rather than we just plug and play and things return as normal. No, let's use it as, wait, what does it feel like to hug? What does it feel like to stand on the stage and tell a story? Like, let's get back to basics. Let's remember why this art form matters. What point do you want readers to take away from your book? I'm a curious kid. I'm looking for my language. I'm looking for answers to the mystery of this life. I have a gifted mom who's a spiritualist, but I don't see spirits. I don't have premonitions. I'm looking for God. I'm going to Quaker meeting. I'm like, looking all over the place. I'm seeing my cousins dance wildly to beautiful merengue, but I'm seeing them struggle through the AIDS epidemic and through the crack cocaine epidemic. And there's a line late in the book where I say, I realize something. I realize my cousins are that of God within me, right? That's the Quaker notion is there is that of God within all of us. But I, I came to my own realization, my cousins were that of God within me. I was born into the church. My faith is right here next to you, you know, Guka, who's one of my cousins, as we, as we eat together. Um, so that was for me the point of the book. I want readers to walk away seeing their loved ones with that sort of renewed faith, even including the hard times and the resiliency and the struggle. But it's been very... Uh, I was going to say, but it's been very interesting to see readers take their own thing away. Um, one thing I've heard over and over, is not just from from Puerto Rican readers and from non-Puerto Rican readers, which is that they knew so little about the island's history, and they were really happy to learn more. I was like, that's so cool, you know. Another one is um, there's a, a little chapter called "My Mom's Accent." And it's me as a 43 year old woman looking back on my childhood and remembering times I would kind of tease my mom lovingly for her pronunciation of English, or I would cor correct her English and realizing now that she had to earn English in a way I have never had to. And that in some ways that makes it more her language than mine, even though it's my first language. She gave me English. You know, so it's English isn't mine. She gave it to me. And people, I will tell you, a lot of people are, are connecting with that notion of like, my parents were born into a different language. Let me ask them, when did you learn English, dad? When did you learn English, mom? What was that like? Uh, so that's been really cool to hear readers connecting with. I'm interested. So you've adopted or you've been called to Quakerism as your religion, as your path to God? Well, as a teenager, yes, that was part of my path. My husband and I got married in the Quaker meeting house on 15th and Cherry in Philadelphia by a bilingual Lutheran minister. Um, but no, I would say if I had to, if I had to characterize my current path, it's, it's, it's still pretty like interfaith and open in a way that includes all of those faiths of my childhood. That includes um, the native Taino component that includes the Lukumi component that is um, Afro-Caribbean, that path, and also is, the- is that, kind of, is that similar to Wicca or does it include Wicca? No, Wicca is a, a different, um, I think also involves natural healing and stuff, but that's a different tradition that I, I, I as far as I'm aware, is not a syncretic religion that originate, originates in Nigeria, blends with Catholicism on the islands and becomes its own philosophy and practice. Interesting. So um, your next project, what's your next project? 
my next project, well, I have In the Heights coming out um, in June and then also this summer, a movie called Vivo. That's an animated feature that I also wrote with Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, and it's, it's a story of friendship and it's a story of love and it starts in Cuba and it ends in Miami and it's, it's a real hoot. All right, well, we wish you all good things in your future path and thank you so much for taking this time with us. Thank you, it was my pleasure. That's it for this edition. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.